Welcome to Real Chemistry. I'm Dr. Morris, and today we're going to talk about the rigid rotor and microwave spectroscopy. Microwave spectroscopy is basically just thinking about what happens to our molecules when we put microwave radiation on them. And it turns out it causes them to rotate. So for example, in your microwave, when you shine microwaves down onto, say, your bowl of soup, what it does is it causes all the water molecules in that bowl of soup to start spinning, and that heats up your soup. And we can actually use this in the context of a laboratory to see how our light is absorbed when we shine it on different molecules. And it turns out it'll cause those molecules to start rotating. And we can figure things out from that, like, say, what the bond length is. And we'll get to that in a minute. So what's the rigid rotor? Well, the rigid rotor is a quantum mechanical model system, kind of like the harmonic oscillator or the particle in the box, that helps us think about this system. And so the rigid rotor just says, okay, let's treat our molecule like two masses connected to each other and they're fixed in terms of the distance apart they are. So it's different than the harmonic oscillator which allows it to vibrate. The rigid rotor is rigid and it can rotate. And we can use the rigid rotor to get out all the different energy levels our molecule can be at in terms of its rotational energy. And that'll allow us to calculate the energy gaps between the different rotational states and that helps us think about what wavelengths of light or what energies of light it would absorb when it changes between the different rotational states. Let's take a look at the energy eigenvalues for the rigid rotor. This is what we're gonna to use to think about our microwave spectroscopy. So this is our equation for our energy eigenvalues for our rigid rotor. It's just like your energy eigenvalues for your harmonic oscillator area particle in the box. We have the energy of the jth state. In this case, we use j instead of n, but the idea is the same. We're just labeling every single successive energy level, and we use j. In this case, j can run from 0, 1, 2, 3, up to infinity. And you'll notice that the energy depends on Planck's constant, the speed of light, and this b, which is called the rotational constant. And we'll talk more about the rotational constant in a minute. For now, let's look at how j affects our energy levels. Well, we have j appearing once, twice, and the one of the times it appears, we add 1 to it, and then we multiply it by j. And so, this is going to be a little bit like our particle in the box, where our energy levels are going to get farther and farther and farther apart as we go higher in J. But it's a little different than our particle in the box in that we add 1 to that first instance of J. Let's take a look at what that actually does to our energy spacings, because remember, it's the transition between our energy spacing levels that will tell us about what wavelengths of radiation will be absorbed. So here I have the different energy levels laid out for our rigid rotor. And remember that we can calculate them by plugging in the appropriate j. So let's think about what happens when we plug in zero. Well, when we plug in zero, that means that j is zero and that j is zero. And so we're multiplying the whole thing by zero. So the energy of our zero state is actually zero. And that means that in our ground state, our molecule is not rotating. So we can have molecules that aren't rotating at all. This is different, you'll recall, than the harmonic oscillator. The harmonic oscillator in the ground state our molecules are always vibrating. But for the rigid rotor and the ground state, our molecules can just be still. That is not rotating. All right, what happens when we plug in J of 1? Well, if we plug in 1 to this guy, we're going to get HCB times 1 times 1 plus 1. So that's going to turn out to be 2 HCB. Okay, let's think about plugging in e, uh, J equals 2. When I plug in J equals 2, I'm going to put in 2, add 1. That gives me 3. And then I'm going to multiply it by 2. That's going to give me 6 HCB. And then let's plug in 3. Then I plug in 3. I'm going to add 1 because it says J plus 1. So that gives me 4. And then I multiply it by my 3. And that's going to give me 12 HCB. So you can see that as my energy goes up, my gaps get farther and farther apart. And it turns out that each successive gap gets 2 HCB farther apart. So you'll notice between the zero state and the first state, we have 2 HCB. Between the second state and the third state, we have 4 HCB, an additional 2 HCB. Let's take a look at this written a little more neatly. Here are our different energy levels. And each time we go up, we get 2 HCB farther apart. And what that means is, when we look at our microwave spectra, we're going to see a series of peaks because each of these transitions will be at different energies. Let's take a look at what I mean by that. So here you have, in the top, our energy levels. And in the bottom, you have a microwave spectra. This is showing 
microwave radiation that's been absorbed. And you see four peaks. One, two, three, four peaks. Let's talk about where each of those peaks comes from. Well, if I put on microwave radiation and my molecule happens to be in the ground state, then what that would do is cause my molecule to transition from E equals zero to E equals one. And that amount of energy would be two HCB. So that's this peak right here. So this turns out to be E zero to E one. On the other hand, if I start out with my molecule in the first excited state and I transition it to the second excited state, that gap is six HCB minus two HCB or four HCB. So that's this guy right here. It turns out to be E1 to E2. On the other hand, it could start in the second state and go to the third state. There I'm going from 6-HCB to 12-HCB. So that means that I would get out 6-HCB as the difference. Remember, it's the change in energy that you're seeing show up on the spectra. Because what we're doing when we put light on it is we're kicking a molecule from one rotational state up to the next. And if I start in the second state and go to the third state, my change in energy will be 6-HCB. So that means this guy is E2 to E3. And lastly, this peak is E3 to E4. So notice that you see four peaks here, and that's also different from, say, vibrational spectroscopy, where you typically only see one peak. Rotational energies are much lower in energy than vibrational energies. And what that means is that just because of the temperature around, we'll have our molecules starting out in different states. So Initially, you'll have some molecules in the ground state, some molecules in the first excited state, some molecules in the second excited state, and that means you'll get a series of peaks. And the spacing between the peaks is what's pretty interesting. Notice that the gap between each of our peaks is always 2HCB. And the reason that is, is that every single time we go up in an energy level, we add 2HCB to our spacing. So this is a subtle issue, right? But we go from energy of 0 to 1, and that's 2HCB. We go from energy of 1 to 2, and that's 4 HCB. We go from energy to 2 to energy of 3, that's 6 HCB. So you notice each time we're getting 2 HCB high there. And that means that the gaps between our peaks will always be 2 HCB. And that's a really useful fact, because when we go and actually measure a spectra or spectra for the microwave um, absorption, we won't get HCB out, we'll get some energy. So for example, let's say that we get out 10 EVs. Well, now we can relate that to our microwave constant. Let's talk about that microwave constant and then we'll take a look at the spacing. So here's our rotational constant. And you'll notice that if we look at the equation for our rotational constant, we have B and we have Planck's constant appearing again and pi and C, but we know what all of those things are. So let's focus on the things that we're a little less familiar with. B is the rotational constant, as I've already said. Mu is the reduced mass. And so the reduced mass is just a way to take the fact that we have two masses in our system and combine them into one. It's just basically a math trick. Importantly, we also see this R here, and R is the bond length. And that means that if I have my rotational constant, which I can get from the spacing of my microwave radiation, I can get out bond length. And that's really the key thing that microwave spectroscopy does for us. So let's take a look at a specific instance of that. So here what we have is uh, our microwave spectra. And if you go into the lab, you can measure those gaps. And let's say we measure that it's 1.5 times 10 to the minus ninth EV. First thing to notice, that's a really small amount of energy. And that's because rotational energies are really, really small. It's really, really easy to kick a molecule from rotating a little bit to rotating a little faster. And that peak spacing, if I know it as 1.5 times 10 to the minus uh, nine EV, and I also know that it's equal to 2HCB, I can calculate the bond length, right? Basically, from my spectra, I got this equation. 2, or 1.5 times 10 to the minus 9th EV is equal to 2HCB. And since I know H, and I know C, and I know what my rotational constant is, I can go ahead and get out bond length. And that's what microwave spectroscopy does for us primarily. It allows us to use a rigid rotor model to figure out the bond length for a diatomic molecule. So in the next video, which I'll link to below, we'll actually go through an example where we calculate the bond length from the rotational constant. Thanks for watching this episode of Real Chemistry. Check out the next one to see a practice problem.